In this sermon, we're going to continue right where we left off last week. And if you recall, last week we were studying in our series on the church, uh, Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to the church. And then we compared that with Matthew chapter 18 and Philippians 1 verse 1 and other passages. And we concluded this, that Jesus has given the keys of the kingdom to the church, the church which consists of officers and members. And as Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to the church, he gives to the officers a key of authority. Officers have authority in the church. And he gives to the members liberty, a key of liberty. And then after distinguishing between authority and liberty for the officers and the members, we then dedicated the rest of our time to discussing the authority of the elders or the officers. And so in this sermon, we immediately transition to discussing the liberty of the members so that we can then relate the two together, the authority of the elders and the liberty of the members. And we're specifically going to see how these two keys work together, the key of authority and the key of liberty, in order to, when these keys work together, in order to do all that the church has been called to do as a church. Now, our our outline will consist of four main points, four main points, and we're going to jump right into it with our first main point, number one, liberty of conscience. Liberty of conscience. When we discuss the liberty of the membership, especially in relation to the authority of the eldership, we must begin by talking about liberty of conscience, which then asks the question or or brings up the question, what exactly is liberty of conscience? And so under this main point, we're going to have four sub points. And just so you know, we we are going to spend the majority of our time on point, the main point one and main point two. So the fact that there's four subpoints here kind of indicates to you, okay, we'll spend more time on this than perhaps some of the other points in the sermon. So main point is liberty of conscience, going down to four subpoints, the first of which is this. Number one, Jesus has freed us from condemnation. Jesus has freed us from condemnation. When we talk about liberty of conscience, there's actually a couple different things related, but different things that we mean. The first thing we mean is that Jesus has freed us from condemnation. Now think about this with me. God has so made us as human beings that we have consciences. We have a faculty that discerns between right and wrong, between good and evil. Now it doesn't infallibly discern that. So Jiminy Cricket can't can't say, and always let your conscience be your guide. Well, yes, you you should discern between right and wrong, but your conscience won't always get things right, will it? Nevertheless, we have a faculty of discernment between right and wrong. Now, if you are aware, fallibly, but aware of right and wrong, then you are aware of when you do right and you do wrong. You're aware of when you sin and when you obey the law of God. What happens when you sin? What happens when you break the law of God? What does your conscience do? Your conscience says you have sinned. Your conscience says you have done that which is wrong. You have done evil in the sight of the Lord. So our consciences declare us to be guilty of our sin and our consciences condemn us. We are sinful. We are sinful. We are sinful because we sin, we sin, and we sin again. Now, What has Jesus Christ done in his death and resurrection for us, for all those who trust in him? What is the benefit of Jesus for all people who trust in his death and resurrection? It is freedom from this condemnation. It's salvation from our sins. It is forgiveness, all of our wickedness being washed away in his blood and us being declared righteous in the eyes of God. As we sang in the hymn, his robes for mine. He condemned in my place as though he had sinned. And us being clothed in the robes of Jesus Christ's righteousness, viewed and declared as righteous in the eyes of God the Father. Jesus, through his sacrificial death, reconciled us to God and won for us the forgiveness of our sins and everlasting life. 
What does Paul say in Romans 8.1, quoted so many times and so for good reason? Oh, Romans 8.1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And so our consciences, when they say we are guilty of sinning, that's true. But if they condemn us, that's not true. That's false. Our consciences cannot condemn us. We are free in our consciences. Have I sinned? Yes, I am forgiven by the Lord. I am not condemned. So we feel guilty, but we know that we are not condemned for our sins because we trust in Jesus Christ and repent of our sins. Do you remember what John said in 1 John 3, verses 19 to 21? He said, our hearts condemn us. But when our hearts condemn us, how can we have confidence before God? How can we have assurance before him and, and reassure our hearts? John told us that we have assurance when we remember that God knows all things. What does God know? That his son is at his right hand, that his son has died and risen again, that his son has died for us, that we have, risen, that we have trusted in him. There's no question that there's no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. There's no question with God regarding those things. And so our hearts may get things wrong and condemn us, but we have assurance that God is greater than our hearts, John says. God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. So the heart may forget that there is no condemnation for us, but God does not forget. And our consciences are free from that condemnation. In your own time, I would encourage you to read chapter 21 of our Confession of Faith, which deals with liberty of conscience and, and wonderfully and simply or concisely sums up this liberty that Jesus has won for us. He has freed us from the condemnation and the curse of sin. Secondly, the second subpoint, Jesus has freed us from the commandments of men, or commands if you want. Jesus has freed us from the commands of men. When we talk about liberty of conscience, we don't just mean that we've been freed from condemnation and we live with, in peace with God. We also mean, in addition to that, we mean that Jesus has freed us from any obligation to obey that which men command us religiously. Now, how does this relate to the conscience? Well, once again, the conscience discerns between right and wrong. We must do that which is right. We must not do that which is wrong. And so when someone comes to you and says, you must do this, then you must discern, must I do that thing? Is that is that thing which is being commanded to me, is that right or wrong? The conscience is deciding, should I respond with obedience to the command? Am I bound to do this? Am I obligated to do this? And Jesus has freed us from all commandments of men religiously that in any way contradict or go beyond his word. Now, we must be clear that we are speaking specifically in a religious context. For example, in a civic sphere, in the civic sphere, not in a religious sphere, we are to obey the civil magistrate. When the magistrate says, pay your taxes by April 13th, <laughs> you should pay your taxes by April 13th. If the civil magistrate says, drive 45 miles per hour, you should drive 45 miles per hour. You don't say, well, I don't find 45 miles per hour in the word of God, or April 13th in the word of God. That that's, doesn't matter. That's something else. The word of God tells you to obey the civil magistrate who tells you to drive 45 miles per hour and file your taxes on time. So in this context, we are specifically discussing liberty of conscience in a religious sphere. In other words, what must I offer unto God as worship? What has God called me to do in a religious way as worship unto him? What am I obligated to do in the church? Well, the state tells us what to do in the church. We ignore them. We, ha we are under no obligation to obey them whatsoever. They have no authority. Our consciences are free from their authority in such matters. I'd like you to please turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, and then we'll turn to Colossians 2 after that, where we're going to see Paul asserting, declaring the liberty of our consciences from the commands of men in a religious context. Galatians chapter 5.
Remember that the Judaizers, as they're often called, the Jews who, well, we'll just go through it. Paul says this, for freedom Christ has set us free, freedom, liberty, stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What's the yoke of slavery? It was the Judaizers who said you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to experience the benefits of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They didn't, these Judaizers didn't deny Jesus Christ. They wanted to add on to religion in the name of Jesus. They wanted to add on to that circumcision and all of the the laws of Moses, dietary laws especially, laws of cleanliness and uncleanliness. And Paul says, don't. You've been freed from this. Your conscience does not have any obligation to respond to those commands. Now turn over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. Similar context, people insisting you must do this as worship, as life unto God. Colossians 2, 20 to 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Regulations such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These things have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. They have no religious power, no religious value, and they have no obligation upon the conscience. The conscience does not have to respond to do not handle, do not taste, and do not touch. So we find, brothers and sisters... That Jesus has given us commands in his word, commands to do as service unto him, and our consciences are free from all commands that go beyond or violate the commands of Christ in the scriptures. We can follow the example of Peter and John who said in Acts 4.19, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. The leaders in Jerusalem told them, stop preaching. We won't, pers- we won't put you in jail if you just, just stop preaching. Just be quiet. And John and Peter said, you, you discern. Let your consciences decide. Whom should we obey? God or you? The an- obvious answer is our consciences must obey God, and we are free from your command not to preach. So our consciences are free from the curse of sin. Our consciences are free from the commands of men that violate the commands of Jesus Christ in a religious context. Thirdly, third sub-point. Number three, Jesus has freed us to obey his commands. Jesus has freed us to obey his commands. This is a very important point because the liberty that Jesus has given to us is not an absolute liberty. It's not an absolute freedom. It's not a free-for-all. It's not a freedom to do what we want to do. Jesus has given us a space, the church. He's given us an environment with a set of commands where we have absolute freedom to do what he has called us to do. And no one can stop us. No one can tell us no or to do different things. We have complete freedom to do what Jesus has called us to do. Now, remember that what this means is We don't have freedom not to do those things. We have freedom to do those things. We don't have freedom not to do those things. Jesus has freed us in order that, so that we might and we may obey his commands. That means that my conscience and your conscience is obligated and bound to obey and believe everything that is commanded to you and taught to you in the scriptures. Your conscience is not free. Do I want to do that? Do I not want to do that? That's not what freedom of conscience is. Freedom of conscience is, I must do that which is right, and Jesus has freed me to do that which is right. I must not do that which is wrong. And so when Jesus calls us and commands us to do certain things in the church, we are not free to do otherwise. We must do those things, and we must do them in the way that they have been commanded. We are bound, our consciences are bound by the authority of Jesus Christ. 
So be careful not to think that liberty of conscience is subjective about what we want to do or what we don't want to do and what we decide for ourselves. Well, this is good for me or not good for me. That's not what liberty of conscience is, and that would be an abuse of liberty of conscience. Liberty of conscience is Jesus has called me to do this. No one can tell me to do otherwise. Now, this presents a a difficulty because we all have the same word of God. We all have the same set of the commands of Jesus Christ. And the truth is the truth, and the commands are the commands, whether or not we believe and obey them. So our liberty of conscience does not decide what are and are not commands. They're there, and our conscience must respond to them. But each, each one must respond to the scriptures as they understand the scriptures. Their consciences must, the, the point of it is this. This is the binder of our consciences. Everyone must answer to this for the binding of their conscience. To say, this is what I must do and must not do, we must have the word of God as the basis for it. It is not what I want to do or don't want to do, or feel I should do or feel I should not do, but rather the word of God binds everyone's conscience to do that which it commands and that which it teaches. But each person must be convinced of the scriptures in such a case. The point, to put it this way, their consciences must be bound by the word of God and they must be bound by how they understand the word of God. There is no appeal to liberty of conscience apart from the teaching of scriptures because it is not an absolute freedom. It is a freedom to believe and obey what Jesus Christ has commanded us to believe and obey. We will explain this a bit more in the second main point, because you may have some questions in your mind about that. And you may have some of those questions answered in the next sub-point, number four. Number four, church confessions and constitutions are critical. Church confessions and constitutions are critical. If each person's conscience must be bound by the scriptures, and if a pope or a magistrate cannot compel the conscience to believe certain things, then how do we as individuals agree together and hold one another mutually accountable to the teaching of the scriptures? Well, church confessions and constitutions resolve this question. Through a confession of faith, a church publicly declares its beliefs. It declares, we understand the scriptures to teach this. The confession of faith is a declaration of what we believe the scriptures teach. It is therefore the doctrinal basis of unity in the church. We unite together in this common understanding of the word of God. And therefore, we can hold one another accountable according to this common standard of doctrine, namely the confession of faith. So does this mean that our consciences are bound by a non-scriptural document? Well, yes and no. Yes, our consciences are bound by a quote-unquote non-scriptural document, but because everyone voluntarily assents and agrees to it, beforehand as being a faithful exposition of what? The scriptures. Yes, I agree. This is what the scriptures teach. And so your conscience is responding to the word of God as expressed in a human made document, but one that we believe is accurate in summing up the teachings of the scriptures. And so people voluntarily agree and unite in a church doctrinally through a confession of of faith. No one has compelled their conscience to do that. No one has compelled them, as you enter this door, your beliefs become this thing. People voluntarily agree, this is what we believe. So the conscience is not compelled to believe the confession of faith, but the conscience is accountable to it once declaring that's what you believe, because it is an expression of the scriptures. 
And so when you join the church or consider joining the church, the Confession of Faith makes it very clear what the standard of doctrinal accountability is. This is what is believed. This is what is taught here. No one will force you to believe it. You have assented. You have voluntarily joined yourself to a church that believes these things. And one of the criteria of joining the church is that you say, do you agree that the Confession of Faith summarizes the teaching faithfully summarizes the teaching of scriptures. In that way, all who unite and agree in the confession are united in agreeing that their consciences are bound by the scriptures according to this expression of what the scriptures teach. We even have in our constitution a clause that says, if you're a member and you find that you can no longer subscribe to the confession, you can no longer live as as this being the understanding of what the scriptures teach, you need to declare that. And you need to make it known to the elders so that the appropriate actions can be taken. What kind of actions? Well, it it depends on what what the issue is and whether restoration can take place. It would be a case-by-case basis. The point is simply our, our Constitution specifically stipulates you need to agree to the confession. And as a member, if you if you begin to disagree with it, you need to declare that so that it can be worked through. Now, speaking of the Constitution, that brings that into play now. Constitutions are very critical in churches. Why? Because they form not the doctrinal basis of unity, but the practical basis of unity. Constitutions tell everyone up front beforehand, this is the way that things run. This is the way that this church operates practically. And if our consciences are only to be bound by scriptures, then you need to know what is going to be expected of you as a member and how the government of the church functions in this particular church. So you ask yourself, do I have a vote in the receiving and removing of members? Do I have a vote in church discipline? Do I have a vote in the election of officers? If you believe that the scriptures teach that you have a role to play in such such things, our Constitution affirms you have a role to play in these things. And you should consider a church constitution carefully, because if you say you agree, you need to agree. Not just doctrinally, but also practically. To sum up the point, our consciences are free from condemnation or the curse of the law. Our consciences are free from the commands of men that violate the word of God. Our consciences have been freed in order to obey the commands of Jesus Christ. Confessions and constitutions declare this openly and publicly and objectively so that a people can agree and unite together without their consciences being imposed upon. They voluntarily assent, they voluntarily unite on this doctrinal and practical basis of unity in the confession and the constitution. Well, this brings us to our second main point. Number two, liberty of consent. Liberty of consent. This is where we're going to bring together the liberty of the members and the authority of the elders of the church, which we studied last week. <clears throat> and we're going to have three subpoints. They will be shorter than the previous. Number one. Excuse me. The key of authority cannot force the key of liberty. The key of authority cannot force the key of liberty. The elders possess the key of authority in the church. They are, in the scriptures, they're told to oversee, to govern, to guide, to teach, and to correct. The members are told to respect and to honor and obey the elders. So there is a true authority in the elders in their office, which the persons fill the role of the office and thereby exercise its authority. And we've seen that the authority of the elders comes directly from Jesus Christ. It is not an authority derived from the congregation although they are called to that office by the congregation, so also the liberty of the members is derived directly from Jesus Christ and not from the elders. The elders do not, with their authority, then create some kind of liberty for the members. Not at all. The liberty of the members as the authority of the elders both come directly from Jesus Christ. As the members do not grant authority to the elders, the elders do not not grant freedom to the members, Jesus Christ does. This means, therefore, that the key of authority cannot force the key of liberty. They turn 
independently of one another, though we will see they are designed to cooperate. The authority of the eldership is not designed or intended or able to force the key of liberty. And so the elders guide and govern various processes in the church, but the elders themselves cannot effect or bring about or bring to completion those processes in and of themselves. The membership has a liberty of consenting. Now let me be specific. We've seen in other sermons, as we made our way through scriptural passages, that in the scriptures the congregation participates in a variety of things in the church, in church discipline, in the election of officers, as well as in the the admitting or remitting, the receiving and expelling of members in the church. And so in those things, the keys of the kingdom matters, the things of official church power, the key of authority with the elders cannot, in and of itself, on its own, discipline, elect, or admit and remit members apart from the consent of the church, apart from the key of liberty cooperating with the key of authority. The elders cannot, as we've said in other sermons, the elders cannot inform the congregation, by the way, here are new members, we have added them to the church. The elders cannot say, by the way, here are new officers, we've added added them to the church. The elders cannot say, we have removed these persons from the church. They don't have authority to to excommunicate in and of themselves. So the key of authority cannot by itself accomplish these things and force the key of liberty. The consent of the members is necessary in order for church power to be exercised. Second subpoint the key of liberty cannot force the key of authority. The key of liberty cannot force the key of authority. The membership has the freedom, the liberty of consenting or not consenting to the guidance and governing authority of the elders in the aforementioned items. But that does not create two rival elderships, 120 against six or 130 against six. This doesn't create two two elderships, a minority and a majority eldership. That's not how this works. Because the key of liberty is not a key of democratic authority. The key of liberty is the liberty of consenting or not consenting. And so the membership with the key of liberty, they also cannot effect or bring about uh, the, the, the aforementioned items. So, for example, if the elders proposed a candidate for membership, the, the membership can vote and say, we do not agree that this person is a valid candidate, and they could, they could not consent in that. But they could not then say, but we have decided that this other person is indeed a valid candidate, which the elders have not proposed, and we are going to bring them into the membership. Their key of liberty could not force the key of authority to, to permit that process to reach completion. They do not have authority to say, these are our membership candidates. These are our officer candidates. These are those whom we are going to discipline. These are those whom we are going to expel from the church. The key of liberty does not have authority to guide and govern those processes. It has liberty to consent or not consent with the leadership and authority of the elders. So the key of authority and the key of liberty, what is the ideal? Well, number three, sub point three, the keys of the kingdom concur. There's a lot of alliteration in this outline. The keys of the kingdom concur. Here's the beauty of Jesus' design for the church. The authority of the elders is limited. It is authority to to guide and govern in that which Jesus has commanded us to do. The liberty of the members is to be guided and governed governed in that which Jesus has commanded them to do. And so if they, if they discern from the word of God that the elders are guiding and governing them in something contrary to the commands of Christ, they have liberty not to consent. And the elders do not have authority to guide and govern them in other things. So, for example, the elders cannot say, okay, today we are going to, all of the members must, as an act of worship to God, Stand up and do a holy dance before the Lord. Uh, Everyone would say, where are we commanded to do that in the scriptures as worship? If you want to go home and and have a dance in your backyard or whatever, you want to have a dance with a bunch of the brothers in the church, great, have your dance. But if it's put upon your conscience as an act of worship, we could never do that. 
We would not have the authority to propose that, and the membership would have the liberty to, to not consent if it were proposed. The keys of the kingdom are designed to concur, so that the, the elders say this, according to the scriptural criteria of what a New Testament Christian is, believes, and does, we believe this person fits that. We present them to you, membership, for a vote the membership consents, not on whether they like the person or not, not whether or not they feel like making them a member or not. The, the, the conscience of the member, not that it's in your head, but you know what I mean. The conscience of the member is bound by scripture. Does this person meet the criteria or no? If they do, I must affirm them as a member of this church. I'm not free to do otherwise. But if the, if the elders propose a membership candidate who does not meet those requirements then the membership can say, my conscience is bound not to affirm them as, as being a valid candidate for the membership, and I should, I should vote no. That's why we give a time before proposing something for people to consider, to question, to ask. That's why we have testimonies in the bulletin and all these things, is that the design is for the keys to concur, for the, scriptures to, for the elders to say, according to the scriptures, we're going to do, we propose to you that we do this. The people say, yes, my conscience is bound by the scriptures. I believe that that is correct, Yes, the key of authority and the key of liberty concur. They work together and cooperate in order to exercise true church power. This is all about the commands of Christ. This is not about other things. And the members and elders have agreed together on a common confession of faith, that is a common understanding of the scriptures, and a common constitution that is the way in which we do things practically. This is the way, this is what we believe, and this is what we do. And so everyone knows. There's no surprise, there should be no surprises in the church. Everyone should know this is what we believe, and this is what we do. And when, it com- when something comes to a vote, the members know their responsibilities, the elders know their authority to lead in the appropriate manner, and the keys, therefore, can turn together and open the doors of the kingdom to receive new members or to expel sinning members who will not repent and to shut the door against them until they do so. The key of authority and the key of liberty are designed to cooperate and function together. The liberty of the members does not invalidate the authority of the elders. The authority of the elders does not run roughshod over the liberty of the members. And the result of the key of authority and the key of liberty operating according to the commands of Jesus. When I do this, that's a key turning in a door, by the way, in case that's not clear. When, when that happens rightly, when according to the commands of Jesus Christ, we do what Jesus has called us to do in the way that he has called us to do it, what do we see then? We see a vital, functional church of Jesus Christ bringing in new members, baptizing them, participating in the Lord's Supper, disciplining when necessary to restore our members, and if necessary, to remove sinning members and to ordain, as Christ gives to us, new officers in the church. And the beauty of liberty of conscience is that it it has as its center not our feelings, not our preferences, but the commands of Jesus Christ. The elders cannot go beyond that. The members must respond to that. So when you, when you vote, brothers and sisters, in a church vote, whatever the vote is, whether it's for a discipline case or for new members or for excommunications or for officers, you must have in your mind a scriptural reason. And you say, but I don't find uh, John Doe in the scriptures to know whether they're a proper candidate for membership or, or an officer. You say, no, 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 that's not the point. The point is the scriptures give us criteria. Does this person match the biblical criteria for discipline or membership or officers, etc. Your vote is not what you want to do. Your vote is what the scriptures guide you and lead you to do. And so you can rest in that. And you have freedom. You have liberty to consent or not consent according to the commands of Christ. But it must be according to the commands of Christ. It must not be because I don't want to or I don't think so. It needs to be this is what the word of God teaches. Our consciences answer to nothing else, and so they can appeal to nothing else. Thirdly, the two final points will be briefer. Number three, liberty of circumstances and wisdom. 
Liberty of circumstances and wisdom. If you've been here for some time, you will likely have heard from this pulpit the distinction between law and wisdom. Law says this is what must be done. This is right and wrong. Wisdom says there are, there are a variety of poten- potential legitimate options. So law is right and wrong. Wisdom is better and worse. Could do this, could do that. Has advantages and disadvantages for each one. The wise choice is not necessarily the right choice as opposed to the wrong choice, but the better choice as opposed to worse choices or choices that aren't as good as that one. Now, when we talk about worship in the church, we often distinguish between the elements of worship, the things which we must do, the elements, and then we talk about the circumstances of worship, which are ancillary side details that could be done one way, could be done another way. They're related issues that can be done in a variety of ways. So we must praise God in song according to his word. We don't have a liberty not to. And we must read his word. And we must pray according to his word. And we must preach the word. These are elements of our worship. But how many hymns? And which hymns? And how long should the sermon be? And what should we preach? And how many sermons should we preach in a day? And what time of day should we meet? And where should we meet? And what color should the walls be? And what's up with these blue chairs that only people never sit in? And, you know, we could go on and all sorts of things. Why are are there fake plants here? I don't know. What's the point? There's elements of worship, which our consciences must respond to. We must do these things. And then there's circumstances. There's wisdom issues that could be one way, could be another way. We used to have an evening service. Now we have an afternoon service. Guess what? We could go back to an evening service if we wanted to, and there would be no sin one way or the other. Why is this important? It's important for the members of the church to remember that there are many things in the life of the church that are not in any way a matter of church power or the keys of the kingdom. And most of these ancillary, circumstantial things are matters of wisdom that could be done one way or not the other way. And so, here's the conclusion of these things. When the elders and the deacons, or the elders and deacons, make decisions about many of these things without a church vote, in in fact, often not asking, perhaps, people about their opinions on certain things, we are not in any way infringing the liberty of, of the members, because the liberty of the members relates to church power, the exercise of the keys of the kingdom. And the color of the paint on the walls, or the time of the services, or the length of the sermons, or the choice of the hymns, and many other things are not matters of church power, but of wisdom related to the life of the church. And this is important because I've seen many examples in my own experience, um, maybe not many. And perhaps it's even better for me to say I've heard many examples, more than experienced them myself, where people in churches become unnecessarily and inappropriately upset about a wisdom decision in the church. And they demand a scriptural warrant for certain things. And they claim that apart from a scriptural warrant, they object to that decision. Where does it say this in the word of God? You say, well, let's, let's calm down here for a moment. But this is not an issue of the saith the Lord or the conscience being bound in one way or another. And when we, as soon as we realize that, it, it kind of desensitizes and relaxes quite a bit the way that things are in the church. And I hope that you understand that if you think that someone perhaps, something perhaps could be done or should be done differently in matters of wisdom, you're very free to come and express that to the elders and the deacons and make suggestions. We would be glad to hear that from the congregation. But most often what I'm talking about happens in the worship, where people say, well, this isn't the way that I'm used to worship being done because they're accustomed to specific instruments or specific styles of music because those instruments and those styles are in the word of God? Uh, No, those are wisdom issues for the most part. And so we just have to guard our hearts against failure to distinguish between law and wisdom and realizing our liberty is not being infringed when wisdom decisions are made and we are not consulted. It lets us desensitize and relax about many, many things. 
And it also means that it gives the members, like I said, freedom to, to offer their opinions on certain things. If, if Maybe I would regret saying this, but if all the members said, we really want the evening service back, you know, we would take that seriously or something like that. But anyway. Fourth main point. We have liberty in circumstances to do this or not do that, and no one's being walked on. No one's being stepped on. No one's church freedom is being imposed on. Number four, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to ever so briefly say what this is. Number four, liberty of, here's a strange word, liberty of consociation. It's like association, but with con at the front. Liberty of consociation. This is an old word for associations, and it works well with my outline. You'll forgive me. The question is this. If local churches have church power to do church things, do we not give up that liberty by joining with formal associations who hold us accountable doctrinally? Aren't they, aren't they binding our consciences by telling us you don't believe or do believe according to the confession certain things and things like that? Aren't we giving up a liberty by joining it with a formal association of churches? And the answer is, is no, because associations also have constitutions and confessions that churches voluntarily commonly agree on as they join together, so no one's forcing anyone to believe anything or do anything. You voluntarily join that, but that's not what makes it free. That's not what, what saves us from giving up our liberty. What, what rescues us and why Baptists are associational and not presbyterial is that the associations carry no church power. They cannot exercise the keys. The association cannot add members to the church. The association cannot ordain officers in the church. The association cannot discipline members in the church. The association cannot remove members from the church. Whereas presbyteries can do many of these things in a Presbyterian form of church government. It depends on the type. But there are many forms of of church government in other denominations or or Um, groups of Christians, where the keys are exercised at a higher level than the local church. And that is not the case in Reformed Baptist associations. The confession itself says that, that the keys of the kingdom can't be exercised by the association. And so it is entirely voluntary, and it is free from key matters. To conclude, two very brief applications and conclusions. Number one, thank the Lord for liberty from the commands of men. Thank the Lord for liberty from the commands of men. It's such a blessing that we don't have to do all sorts of things that people tell us we should do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad I get to eat meat on Fridays. So glad. If you want to fast and deny yourself something, okay, do what you want. But no one can compel your conscience to do that. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Paul says these things have an appearance of wisdom in harsh treatment of the body, but they don't have power. I'm so thankful. What have I been commanded to do? What have I been freed to do? To gather with the church, to sing with the church, to read with the church, to pray with the church, to, to study the word of God preached with the church, to baptize with the church, to partake of the Lord's Supper with the church. These are wonderful blessings that Jesus has given to me. I'm so thankful that I've been freed to do these things and I don't have to do in the name of Jesus. I don't have to do anything else. That is liberty for which I am very thankful And secondly and lastly, thank the Lord for liberty from the curse of the law. Thank the Lord for liberty from the curse of the law. It's one thing to be freed from something that the Pope tells you to do. It's another thing to be freed from everlasting death and judgment and punishment Because as we said at the beginning, our consciences are keenly aware, sensitive to just how much we sin in thought and in word and in deed, outwardly and inwardly. We know how sinful we are. 
We know how wicked we are. There is none righteous, no, not one. We all know it. We may suppress that truth. The unbeliever may suppress that truth in unrighteousness. The unbeliever may exchange that truth for a lie, but we all know it. We are sinful. And so we thank the Lord our God, do we not? We thank the Lord our God that he has freed our consciences, that he has cleansed our hearts, that the curse of the law is not for us. Can't wait for next week's scripture reading in the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, which will declare the freedom that we have in the new life of Jesus Christ resurrected. Oh, what a glorious truth that the sting of death has been removed and the victory of the grave has been overcome with a greater victory. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Jesus was cursed for us, and we are free. Brothers and sisters, rejoice and give thanks to the Lord your God who has set you free from the curse of the law. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you our thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. We thank you that Jesus Christ has freed us to obey him, and he has delivered us from the numerous commandments that we would add to ourselves and that others would add to us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us rest, that you would give us confidence, that you would give us assurance, that you would speak to our hearts by your word. We pray, O Lord, that you would help us to be assured of our salvation and from that assurance and from that joy to serve you in freedom, to serve you with joy and gladness. We pray, O Lord, that you would please help us in these things and that you would cause us to be faithful as elders to lead with authority within the boundaries and according to the commands of Jesus Christ and as members to consent and to participate with the liberty that Jesus has given us in his word and according to his commands. We pray that we would be faithful to you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us, we pray, in your name to our Father and by your Spirit. Amen.